Good afternoon, everyone, uh, once again. Uh, again, the topic will be based on uh, Oriental culture, especially the Hinduism. And the speaker is Ranjit Kingston Gladstone. He is a candidate for uh, PhD in graduate school. And the topic he'd be talking on is Hindus' beliefs in religious pluralism in India, scope for missiological approach. So this time is for Sir Ranjit. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's always good to be with the theologians. This is where you learn many things. And uh, many a times we end up asking questions to find answers. And uh, right after the forum, you spend a month time, like how you spend a month time playing the favorite sport, like now soccer. Once the World Cup ends, for a month you will play soccer. After that, the NBA starts and you change to basketball. Well, forums are always like that. And I'm so happy that uh, being from graduate school, I am here from the Department of Education. I'm here to be part with the Department of Theology. It's always uh, a nice feeling when you would like to talk about your own place, and uh, something that you are very much associated with. Thank you, Sir Puka, for the in introduction. Uh, Pastor, if you're around, uh, thank you for organizing this, and uh, thank you for letting me uh, speak to all of you. For the ones whom I do not know, hello, I am Ranjit Kingston from India, and uh, I will be talking to you about few things for the rest 21 minutes, 8 seconds. This is according to 2017. The religions of the world, as you can see over here, 31% Christianity, 24% Islam, 15% Hinduism, and rest of the religion follows. And... If you see it clearly, this is the religions of the world. And AATS, since we concentrate very much in Asia, when we look into it, Hinduism stands out. Because most of the Western countries, uh, they are the ones who uphold on to Christianity. And the Middle Eastern countries with Islam. And Asia with Hinduism. And... Uh, According to the Pew Research Center, they had a census done in 2010, and they also projected in 2050 how it would be among the Hindu population. As you see, the Asia-Pacific region stands first in comparison with the rest of the regions of the world. As you see, there is also an increase from 25.3% to 
So uh, by 2050, it is expected the Hindu population is going to grow and continue to grow. Now, as a student of missions, if you are one, or if you are one in the future like me, maybe after two years I'll be student of missions, you are still worried about the increase in number such as this. What are we going to do? Do I have any power in my hand? I can do something about it. Or should I so study something about it? It's a question that comes to your mind. And that came to my mind too. And when I looked into the world population percentages, India stands second right after China. And uh, Hinduism being the most uh, prevalent and the major religion in India, this interests me to look into Hinduism. Now, I'm not going to cover the whole religion since uh, many, many years it has been going on and they haven't come up to a conclusion what it is all about. So I will not start now because 1830 is the rest of my time. Now, this brings to the topic that to be presented to you is Hindus' belief in religious pluralism in India, scope for missiological approach. When I was a small boy, as I boarded the bus to go to school, I always see this picture, a similar kind of picture right in front of the bus. The driver will faithfully put a garland for this picture, which has a Hindu god, Buddha, Jesus, a Muhammad, or sometimes they have the picture of uh, representing Islam. All these pictures are together, but all the pictures were garlanded. And they were worshipped. So I used to wonder, how come? Here is a driver who worshipped all the religion together. What is this new religion? I, I was so curious to know. And when I go to the barber shop to cut my hair, it's the same. I see all the gods sitting there. I said, wow, that's nice. And even if I go to any shopping places, I see it over there. All gods are sitting together. Now, I never thought about this concept of pluralism then. But as I moved on, now it reminds me of my past experiences uh, with different religion trying to look into the gods and goddesses having the same pedestal to be worshipped. So here, let me take you into a small journey with the rest of the 16 minutes how Hinduism has a pluralistic uh, view and how as missiologists can take advantage of and do something about it. Now, as I had a preceding speaker who talked about Hinduism, my job is easy because, you know, I just have to tell a few points across because it is well covered. And it said that 12th century BC, Hinduism was born but it is not for sure. This is, has been considered to be born, but many authors and many theories have ruled out this concept, but this is the most outstanding idea that it exists in uh, 12th century BC. Though it has grown for a long period of time, it has no single value system. It has multiple value systems but they do adhere to the truth, the dharma, and karma, which are the concepts in relation to their belief in supreme natural being. So in my paper, I'll be talking about these three. Truth, dharma, and karma. Sadhguru, uh, Sivaya Subramanya Swami, highlighted the pluralistic concepts of Hindu. It is of devoting to God, the religion is filled with love and it is a sound belief in karma. Again, it represents to the truth, dharma and karma. But what about the people in today's world? As Hindus, are they aware of what they believe in? It's a question that I had in my mind too. Because I studied in Seventh-day Adventist school with a highest percentage of 5% Adventist students in my class. 
Later on, I moved to a Catholic school with 0.7% of a Seventh-day Adventist sitting in a classroom. My class, I had 120 students, out of which around 70 of them are Hindus. Today, all of them are connected with each other. We have a WhatsApp group. And this is for the past 25 years, whatever has happened, we still get connected. And that made me a good area for getting the data. Because those are the wonderful people who were Hindus that time until they are Hindus. And I wanted to know what they know about this truth, dharma and karma. So in order to know that, I said to myself, I want to focus my study not digging into the document only, but also I would like to do an empirical study. So this study is an empirical study, not a theoretical study. In empirical study, I chose qualitative approach for a simple reason that I would like to know the descriptive information from my respondents. All right, so for which I had this biblical foundation. The truth, the dharma and karma, how Bible talks to us about it. John 16, 13, it talks about the spirit of truth that will guide us in everything that we need to know about God. And 2 Timothy 2, 15 is God is the one who handles truth correctly. And Psalm 25, 5, he guides me in truth and he teaches me. Now with this biblical foundation, I moved on to study about this uh, Hindu's pluralistic view. So what is truth according to Hindus? Hinduism is a relentless pursuit after truth and there is only one God and one truth. So before I answer what is one truth, they do believe in one truth. But they say, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti. That means there are people who know that there is only one truth, but they keep on spreading many other truths. And finally, it has become so many truths today. And according to them, truth is divinity, and Brahman is truth personified. The one who highlights the truth. Now the devotees who worship Lord Vishnu are the Satya Narayana, the Lord of Truth. Shiva is pure, free from the impurities. And Brahma's creative power arises from the purity of the unconsciousness, chastity and austerity. And according to Upanishad 1.15, it says, Truth is established in Brahma besides austerity and chastity. Now, these are some of the terminologies or the names of the gods and goddesses of Hindus. If you are not uh, well acquainted with, I will not repeat it again and again. Because by the end of the paper, you will remember only Brahma, not what the paper is talking about. So I will move on, getting into the meaning of the truth. The word, word Satya, that means true, real, genuine, honest, sincere, the world of Brahman or the highest world, that is called Satyalog, highest world, the true world. Or an epoch, Satyayug, and water, the life support. Now this all represents the personified Brahma, the truth, the character, and purity. And also I would like you to look at Brihadarnayaka uh, Upanishad. These are some of the documents uh, that highlights about this concept, 5.5.1. In this sage, Yajnavalkya tells the meaning of the word Satyam. Now Satyam is all about truth, but he divides them into the three syllables what it is composed of. Sa, Thi, Yam. Okay, Sa and Yam are true, and uh, the Thi is untrue. And the Thi is later on related to Atnam as... Uh, my preceding speaker mentioned, Atnam or Atman is the Atma, 
the soul, the inner soul of every created being. So why it is untrue? Because it is given to the created being. Sa and Yam stands with the one who created and Thi is given to the one who is, which has been created. So the creator and the created has been put together to formulate the truth. And they say the Thi remains untrue where the creator remains true. But it also gives the hope that you Thi alone will not suffer because there is Sa and Yam come together and help you come back. Now this can bring about many other uh, ideas to talk about. Uh, you know, we will not get into that picture. However, we need to remember Satyam is the truth. And Hinduism propagates, it is not necessarily, only it states with Brahma, the creator, but also the created beings. So it is a hand-in-hand -hand work to establish the truth. That is the concept they are coming up with. Next, I will take you to Dharma. Dharma is the order of the universe and the code of living that embodies the fundamental principles of law, religion, and duty governs all reality. That is your duty towards what the God has given you, what the Lord has given to you. What is your duty? What are you supposed to do? And if you see the chakra of Dharma, this is called chakra of Dharma. Chakra is the wheel. And the wheel of Dharma, if you look at it, you need to have a right view. You need to have a right thinking. You need to have a right speech. You need to have a right action. You need to have a right livelihood, right diligence, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is the chakra of Dharma in Hinduism. Now, don't you think as Christians also we do have these rights? Yes, uh, I was uh, reading an interesting book uh, by a title, Am I a Hindu? This is a conversation between a father and a son. And this conversation is happening in the United States. But the father was questioned by the son. Father, first of all, before you talk about Hinduism, tell me, tell me about your authority over Hinduism. And the father had established his wonderful authority and he has given a wonderful conversation with his son about Hinduism. Now, as I was reading through, I found that he was presenting every point in the context of Christianity. And he says, this is what the Christians tell, but our religion do follow that and we are much better than them. Uh, I wish you can uh, get a copy of it. But it always tells this point. Christian says, and in the Bible, so and so verse says like this, and our Upanishad says the same, but we follow, they don't follow. Now here is a question for each one of you as we move on. Many a times we talk, discuss, do research, present paper, listen to it, but are we people of action? Uh, that is a question to be answered by you. I am not going to wait for the answer. Let us move on. So that is about Dharma. And let's move on to Karma. Karma is to act, to do action. And uh, the Sanskrit word, it means actions and deeds. The law of Karma has a broader principle. Now what is a broader principle? The broader principle is, it is your choice. Do good, live good, so that you will be born good for the reincarnation or rebirth. I, was, I won't say incarnation because that's a different concept. Rebirth. You can be born again and again. You do good, next time you will be born in a palace. You do bad, you will be jumping around like a toad in Ayas ground somewhere. It depends upon you what you want to be. You want to be a toad? or you want to be a son of uh, President Dutarte, it's up to you. That's how Hinduism tells you, right? So the karma has an important role over people, what deed they are to be involved in, what act they have to be part of. Let me refer you to Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, 
and uh, the 17th verse over there the intricacies of karma are very hard to understand therefore one should know what is karma that is action what is vikarma that is a forbidden action the opposite one and what is akarma that is inaction okay the third one is very important for us as christians you know we know the truth and we know what is false but sometimes we stay in between when something is wrong we don't want to speak about it we want to play safe but hinduism says that is also problem that is akarma inaction all right so as christians let us be warned ourselves these are the main ideologies not only found in hinduism but also reflected in christianity that you cannot remain inactive right if you read in revelation it says you cannot sit on the fence right you cannot just look warm you will be thrown out vomited out right so here is what karma is trying to show it off over here likewise it says uh, the aprabdha karma kutha bija and prabaddha karma can be destroyed what do you, what are these sanskrit words you know it comes from all these sanskrit words so let me give you some meanings of it so that we can move on uh, aprabdha means unmanifested uh, reaction prabardha means manifested reaction and bija is sinful desire and uh, kutha is sin kut kutham okay in tamil we say kutram okay so the sanskrit word i think uh, those are from uh, indonesia you also have the basis of the same so now here it says there is a chance in hinduism that before you are going to be born as a frog or a dog you can get rid of such a, a fate by doing something what is it you can go by bhakti to vishnu vishnu is another god so when you decide to come back into your bhakti and go back to god and say god you know i have done these things uh what should i do should i uh feed 1000 people or should i tonsure my head and go to pilgrimage what should i do if i do something all this kutha and your bija will be taken away so instead of me being born as a dog at least i'll be born as a horse right that is much better so there are possibilities given in this religion now to move on also in shrimad bhagavatam uh, in sixth chapter uh, 1.15 it says only a rare person who has adopted complete unalloyed bhakti yoga to shri krishna can uproot the weeds of karma with no possibility that they will revive such a person can do this simply by discharging bhakti just as the sun can immediately dissipate fog by its rays now you can understand over here it says that for you to do that bhakti to you to show how uh, holy you are how you can come back to your god it is a rare possibility all people cannot do you may decide to get back but you may not be able to stand and it says uh, you need to say unalloyed yeah, unalloyed means is a chemistry term over here that means you cannot be a mixture of different chemicals you have to stand alone as your own element that's what it says that you have to stand alone by yourself and it is going to be a hard task and it is going to be a hard task and karma gives you a chance to get back to god provided if you can so here is a test for you in terms of karma so truth dharma and karma these are all the overwhelming truth of hinduism now this is an empirical study as i know i'm going to run fast from now as you have understood that because the time is up philosophical assumptions i have have approached this issue from a constructivist uh, philosophical background uh, with uh, ontology where you can see the individual from their realities subjective participant views matter the values of the researcher are made explicit inductive with the perception of the participant views 
and personal languages used in interpreting the data of the respondents. And the theoretical framework, I use argumentative theory, argumentative theory based on two of these uh, people's model, Stefan Tolmin's structure of argumentation and also with uh, uh, Dan Serber. Uh, I have chosen these two models of argumentation because it fits into taking the consideration of the respondent's view that can contribute how a missiologist could go ahead and meet with people, those who have these type of beliefs, and help them know about Christ and come to Christ. So this is the theoretical model that you see. You have a data, and how do you claim it? You need to go through these process of warrant, backing, qualifier, and reservation. And now, there are many current research done in this area. However, they are not done specifically into the Hinduism of the present generation. What do they know about truth, dharma, and karma? And what a Christian person can make use of their pluralistic view and approach them and do a missiological work. Now, this has not been done in any literature. Therefore, I have come up with these two research questions. What does a Hindu know about truth, dharma, and karma? And how does a Hindu relate to the concept of truth, dharma, and karma with other religions? Now, this is testing, yeah, this is testing the Hindus about their own faith itself so that we can know where are the loopholes so we can tap those opportunities. <coughs> this is the methodology as you can see, a qualitative exploratory case study. Uh, and it is done in south southern state of India, purpose is sampling of 42. Upon consent, interviews were taken, Vir virtual chat room observation was done, documents noted and collected, data were uh, analyzed using in vivo descriptive coding, categories themes were derived. And in missiological research methodology, there are two types of missiological research methodology was used, theoretical convergence and samples of integration, both of from VAN 2017. If you know, there are specific methods of doing missiological research, and uh, this has been followed in this particular study. And these are the findings. We found what do they know about the research, uh, what do they know about their religion in terms of truth, dharma, and karma? They understood that their religion is a polytheistic religion. They have different way of going to God. That's the truth. And liberation from rebirth is possible. Ritual-based system, guidelines for living is clearly stated, and highly misunderstood religion. This is these are the data given by themselves about their own religion. They themselves claim their religion is highly misunderstood because they have a different way of looking at it and each one has a different way of looking at it for that matter. And for the second research question, these are the findings. A few commonalities. How do you see truth, dharma and karma with other religion? They say there are commonalities, but not necessarily 100%. There are few of them. Organization of daily life has been highlighted uh, in both Christianity, Hinduism, and also with the rest of the religion. Rewards for good deeds is found in almost all the religion. And the key difference is the end of the world. I think as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, we uh, kind of emphasize on the end of the world as something very important. And here, that is one of the key difference that has been found across the religion, especially with Hinduism. Now for the discussion, there are three points. Polytheistic belief has loopholes. This is a qualifier according to the model. Okay? So opportunities for strategic penetration for mission could be done. Secondly, standardized lifestyle. Healthy living through nature, diet and exercise is again a qualifier. And as a Christian or as an Adventist, we have a good platform to penetrate into Hinduism to do our mission. Thirdly, rewards. And we believe in eternal life rather than rebirth and also in different other concepts. And here again, we have the same concept of rewards which can take us for our mission directly into the Hinduism. But uh, there are questions that could be answered by doing further research. Like what do the Hindu millennials think about these core beliefs? 
is conversion of religion the main focus of the mission or the life itself now these are some of the things you can consider for further research in a, a different context to conclude truth there is one god but different mediums to reach god hence they act as gods and goddesses according to hinduism dharma they are the stewards of god's providence karma good deeds unto others now also they uh, bring forward the concept the transformation it is not conversion hinduism uh, will not uh, open their hearts immediately for conversion but they will allow for transformation uh, in this book if you read uh, in one of the chapter it says king ashoka has been mentioned by hg wells who never appreciated a king in the history hg wells never appreciated a king in the history but he appreciated king ashoka for a simple reason he was a staunch hindu king but later on he became buddhist <laughs> and it was allowed permitted and he appreciated and the religion also appreciated that now a recommendation <coughs> the truth Christ alone is the savior that we need to understand and uh, we cannot compromise on that concept Christ alone is the savior though we may say there there are many ways of reaching to god through the various mediums but there is no compromising on the factor that there is uh, different names of gods we can use different ways to reach god Christ is the only way the truth and life as it is mentioned in John 14:6 and dharma right to love and treat your neighbor as yourself as bible mentions in mark 12:28 to 34 and karma doing good deeds and uh, matthew 6 in the uh, christ uh, lessons there he says please do it but do it in secretly so that you will be rewarded but if you want to do it publicly you will not be rewarded okay so that is the different way of approaching karma from christian point of view so if you have no christ no life and no freedom if you know christ you have you can know life and you know freedom according to john 8:32 and here is the action plan because for a missiology we need to have a plan unless and until then we cannot do anything about it so here are the five steps followed for making an action plan uh, based on uh, the missiological research these are the five steps uh, we need to have a proper theory so background rational paradigm we need to have proper theology or understanding about truth dharma and karma and also we need to well versed with the historical and cultural background about these uh, trends in hinduism on these three core concepts and we also note the intercultural uh, understanding of the people on those uh, main core beliefs lastly the strategy the strategy is as uh, pastor odiyama mentioned about paul's attitude that's one thing that is very important the right attitude can help us reach out to people here love them as christ loves you that's the mission action plan so hindus will very well accept you if you love them as christ has loved you it doesn't mean you compromise so that's the action plan that i would like to bring out from the study empirical study that i have done uh with uh, the people from south india about hindus pluralistic view on truth dharma and karma as the moderator is coming up i will try to show some of the pictures of the hindu gods and goddesses thank you sir for that nice presentation i see many of us are relaxed and contemplating the presentation because we didn't have to be born frog or horse or anything <laughs> so we praise god that we have eternal life in christ uh we didn't have time for questions so if you have questions maybe you can personally contact him so we will go to the next presentation thank you thank you sir ranjit